Shravanam Kirtanam Vishnu. So one can simply hear the chanting of the glories of the Lord or can attend philosophical lectures on transcendental knowledge given by authorized acharyas. Simply by sitting, one can learn and then one can eat the remnants of the food offered to God. Nice palatable dishes. In every state, devotion of service is joyful. One can execute devotional service even in the most poverty-stricken condition. The Lord says, Patram Pushpam Palam. He is ready to accept from the devotee any kind of offering, never mind what. Even a leaf, a flower, a bit of fruit, or a little water, which are all available in every part of the world, can be offered by any person, regardless of social position, and will be accepted if offered with love. There are many instances of this in history. Simply by tasting the classic leaves offered to the lotus feet of the Lord, great sages like Sanat Kumar became great devotees. Therefore, the devotional process is very nice and it can be executed in a happy mood. God accepts only the love with which things are offered to Him. The essential point to be understood here is that when a living entity surrenders to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, he tells the Lord, My dear Lord, although I am most sinful and unqualified, and for so long I've been trying to forget you, now I am taking shelter at your lotus feet. From this day on, I am yours. Whatever I possess, my body, mind, words, family, riches, I am now offering at your lotus feet. Please do with me as you like. The Supreme Lord Krishna has repeatedly given assurance in Bhagavad Gita that he will protect and redeem such a surrendered living entity, bringing him back home, back to God, for an eternal life in the Lord's own kingdom. Thus the qualification of surrendering to the Lord is so great and spiritually potent that even if a surrendered soul is deficient in other aspects of pious life, his elevated status is protected by the Lord Himself. In other processes, however, such as yoga, because one depends upon his own determination and intelligence and does not actually seek shelter of the Lord, one is subject to fall at any moment. Being protected only by one's own flimsy, limited potency. Therefore, as stated in Srimad Bhagavatam 10.232, Arora Krishna Param Padam Tata Patamti Addo Nandriti Yasmadangaraya. If one gives up the shelter of the lotus feet of the Supreme Lord and instead tries to advance in the yoga process, by one's own determination, or if one tries to make progress in knowledge by one's own speculative power, surely one will eventually fall again to a mediocre material platform, having no protection other than one's own fallible strength. Therefore, the Vaishnava Acharyas in their commentaries on this verse have illustrated in various ways 
the vast superiority of bhakti yoga or pure devotional service. In this connection, Sridhar Swami states, even if running with both eyes closed, a devotee on the path of Bhagavad Dharma will not stumble. Closing one's eyes refers to being in ignorance of standard literature. As it is said, Shruti and Smriti scriptures are the two eyes of the Brahmanas. Lacking one of them, a Brahmana is half blind, and deprived of both, he is considered completely blind. In Bhagavad Gita 10, 10 to 11, the Lord is clearly stating that even if a devotee is lacking in Vedic knowledge, or ignorant of Vaishnava literature, the Lord personally enlightens him from within his heart if the devotee is actually engaged in loving service to the Lord. In this connection, Srila Prabhupada states, when Lord Chaitanya was in Banaras promulgating the chanting of Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, 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 Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama. Thousands of people were following him. Prakashananda, a very influential and learned scholar in Banaras at that time, derided Lord Chaitanya for being a sentimentalist. Sometimes philosophers criticize the devotees because they think that most most of most of the book are in the, me, most of the devotees are in darkness of ignorance and a philosophically naive sentimentalists. Actually, that is not the fact. There are very, very learned scholars who put forward the philosophy of devotion. But even if a devotee does not take advantage of their literature or of a spiritual master, if he is sincere in his devotional service, he is helped by Krishna himself within his heart. So the sincere devotee engaged in Krishna consciousness cannot be without knowledge. The only qualification is that one carry out devotional service in full Krishna consciousness. Yet this facility given by the Lord cannot justify unauthorized concoctions put forward about the process of devotional service. In the name of spontaneous devotion, in this connection, Sri Vishnu Chakravati Thakur has stated, Bhagavad Prakti Artam Pratam Marga Karanam Twati Dushan Vakam Eva. If one manufactures his own process of devotional service for the sake of attaining the Supreme Lord, such a concoction will cause total ruination. Sri Vishnu Chakravati goes on to quote, Shruti Smriti Puranadi Anchara Kriti Vidin Vinam Aitan Tiki Hare Bhaktir Urpata Yaya Kalpate If one so-called unalloyed devotion to God Hare does not take into account the regulations of the Shruti Smriti Puranas and Pancharatra, it is nothing more than a disturbance to society. In other words, even if one is not learned in the Vedic literature, if he is engaged in the loving service of the Lord, he is to be accepted as a pure devotee. Nonetheless, such loving devotion cannot in any way contradict the injunctions of the real Thank you.
Now, of course, if you try to run with your eyes closed, did you ever try to do that? Not very easy thing to do, you know. You don't see too many blind people running. Mm -hmm. So, but here it says, if you run with your eyes closed, you will never trip or fall. And of course, the purport explains what is meant when he talks about eyes closed. It means you don't know the scriptures. There are too many divisions of scriptural knowledge. We have the Shruti and the Smriti. The Shruti being the four Vedas. So the Jnanis, they're very much in touch with the four Vedas. They follow the Shruti. We, of course, in the Shruti there are also the Upanishads. And our Shruti Shupanishad is from the Shruti. But Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam is not Shruti, that is Smriti. So one eye is for the Shruti, one eye is for the Smriti. And in the purport of the script, if you, if you don't know Shruti, then if one eye is closed. And if you don't know Smriti, then the other eye is closed. So in our Krishna consciousness movement, we, we are learning both because Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam teaching us the Smriti and we are learning the Shruti also. We have our Ishopanishad book which is uh, from the Shruti and it's the main Upanishad, the most important of the Upanishads. You don't find too many commentaries on the other Upanishads. So we have knowledge of both of these things. And when we are meet, meeting people, uh, sometimes we will be challenged. Just like one time, one of our devotees, uh, His Holiness Sri Dharananda Goswami, was representing our Krishna consciousness movement. And he was asked to give a talk to a number of Sanskrit scholars so the Sanskrit scholars, generally, they only follow the Shruti. And they're not very, they're not very much eager to hear Smriti. They're generally Jnanis. And it means also Maya bodies, impersonals. So, Ridayananda Maharaj was asked to give a talk, and he spoke, quoting some verses from Bhagavad Gita. And when, of course, some of when the professors heard Bhagavad Gita, they didn't take it very seriously because they don't accept Bhagavad Gita. And if you just present Bhagavad Gita to these kind of people, they will reject it. But as he went on talking, then he introduced some verses from the Upanishads, and particularly one verse which is very important in preaching Krishna consciousness, quoting one verse from the Upanishads, which states, Nityo Nityana, Chaitananas Chaitananya, Eko Bahuna, Yogudati Kama. And when he quoted this verse, then the scholars, the professors were, oh, oh, that they were very agitating. Why, why are you quoting this? You know, they became very, very disturbed because they could understand he was defeating their speculative understanding. Because this verse clearly states that everything is not one. These professors were all my bodies, they were all impersonalists and they were thinking everything is one. But when he quoted this verse from the Upanishads, it clearly states that everything is not one. Because it says, amongst all eternals, there is one supreme eternal being. And amongst all conscious beings, there is one supreme conscious being. And that one Supreme Lord is providing the needs of all others. He's maintaining everyone. 
So it's a very important verse in presenting the Vaishnava philosophy. Because in Vaishnavism, it clearly describes that there's one Supreme Lord and everyone else is his servants. And this is directly against the, the, the speculations of the Kyanis, the, the so-called professors and so on. They know Sanskrit and they can recite nicely Sanskrit mantras and so on, but they speculate about the conclusion of the scriptures. They don't have the shelter of Lord Krishna. And so ultimately, they will fail in their attacks. And we quote the verse from the Srimad Bhagavatam, as it is mentioned in the third word, Arara Krishna Patam Tatam Tada Patam Tipado Nidrita Yasmadandra. They will fall down because their intelligence, although they are intelligent materially, they are not spiritually intelligence. Their, their intelligence is still contaminated by their speculative understanding. They try to understand the Supreme by the strength of their own mind. What can we understand with our limited senses and mind? Certainly it will be limited. We cannot expect to understand the Supreme Lord simply by the strength of our own mind and intelligence. Whatever we understand, it will always be limited and imperfect. But if we want to understand the Absolute Truth, we have to hear and the process is to receive transcendental knowledge. There are two processes. There is ascending knowledge and descending knowledge. If you try to get knowledge by the ascending process, it's a lot of trouble. Prabhupada gives a very clear example that just like the young boy wants to know who is his father, so he can go to so many ladies, he can go to so many men rather, he can go to so many men. Are you my father? Are you my father? Are you my father? And in this way, he will labor very hard. He may never find his father. But if he simply goes to the mother, then the mother can immediately say, who is the father? So this way we understand descending knowledge is easy and practical for us. We want to take advantage of something which is easy and practical. The other process, ascending process, is a lot of trouble and very difficult. Very rarely the gyanis become perfect. Bhagavad Gita also says, huh? after many births and deaths, one who is actually acknowledged, he will understand Vasudev Sarvamiti Samahatma Satyulava. And this is the, the goal of knowledge. The goal of knowledge is to understand Vasudev Sarvamiti. But such a soul, such a Mahatma is very rare. But if they will take to the process of Bhakti, very quickly they can make progress. One doesn't have to be a great scholar. We just simply have to engage in the service of Lord Krishna. And we actually have seen in the course of the Krishna Consciousness Movement how devotees have come from so many different kinds of backgrounds and taken up Krishna Consciousness and they could leave the body in a glorious circumstance. If we go to Mayapur, in Rajapur, at the Jagannath Mandir there, you can see there's a Pushpa Samadhi of Jayananda Thakur. Jayananda Thakur was an early disciple of Srila Prabhupada. And he 
had graduated from university, but he took a simple job as a taxi driver. And he was driving a taxi during the day, but he was also, he became a devotee, he became a devotee at the very beginning of our Krishna consciousness movement. And he gave Prabhupada $5,000, which was a lot of money in the 1960s. He gave it to Prabhupada to print the nectar of devotion book. So Srila Prabhupada appreciated that, that he made that sacrifice, contributing his hard-earned money to allow Srila Prabhupada to print his book. And Jayananda, he somehow he contacted leukemia and he was leaving the body and he could have bought medicine to help him uh, with the pain, but he said, I don't want to waste the money on my useless body. And he just tolerated the pain. And he said, better take the money and give it to Prabhupada for the service of Krishna. And so like this, he would be such a great soul. And Prabhupada said, definitely he's gone back to God. So this was Pasamati in Rajapur, the Jagannath Mandir. He was a very ordinary American man. You know, he was not brought up in the Vedic culture, but he took to Krishna consciousness. And in a few years, he left the body in 1977. He became a devotee in 1967. So for 10 years, he was engaged in Krishna consciousness. But Prabhupada said he went back to God. So some people go back to God very quickly. Some people take small time. Sukadev Goswami had seven days to prepare. He was very serious. Not so serious. Maharaj Pariksha, of course. Maharaj Pariksha, when he was cursed, he had seven days. So he gave up eating and drinking and he simply heard Srimad Bhagavatam. Sukadeva Goswami wants to encourage Maharaj Pariksha because Maharaj Pariksha may be thinking, I only have seven days, I don't have much time to prepare. So Sukadeva Goswami wants to encourage him that you don't need a lot of time. And he gives an example about Katvanga Maharaj. The Katvanga Maharaj was, he had been fighting for the demigods against the demons. And after some time, Kartikeya came to take his place. So the demigods told Katvanga, you can take a rest now, you can stop. And they said, we're so thankful to you for helping us, we will give you benediction. So he said, just tell me, how long do I have left? This world. And the devas told them, you have one moment left. So one moment on the heavenly planets was a bit longer on the air. He immediately came back to the air and he sat in meditation. He fixed his mind on the lotus feet of the Lord and he went back to Godhead. So Sukadeva Goswami encourages Maharaj Pariksha in this way. That even if you have a moment, if you're very dedicated and very serious and you take complete shelter of Krishna, then definitely you can go back to God. And Srila Prabhupada also told the devotees, you just simply follow four principles and chant every day your rounds, at least 16 rounds, then certainly you'll go back to God. Srila Prabhupada promised the devotees this. Srila Prabhupada has a power of attorney on behalf of the Lord that he can bring us back to Krishna. So we take full shelter of our spiritual teacher and we try wholeheartedly to engage in devotional service. We need to be active in the service of Krishna. It's not so much 
the what we're giving to Krishna, but it's the attitude which we're performing the service. This point is made in the preface of the nectar of instruction. Srila Prabhupada writes, everything depends on the attitude of the devotee. That we have to do our activities for Krishna in that mode of loving devotion. And then these activities will be accepted by Krishna. It is not so much the offering, but it's how we are offering it. A nice example in this regard is Duryodhan. Duryodhan had prepared elaborate foodstuffs to offer to Lord Krishna. And he used the best meat. He had so many nice dishes prepared. But Lord Krishna knew the thinking of Duryodhan. That Duryodhan is not his devotee. And when Duryodhan invited Krishna to come and eat some of the food stuff which he had prepared, Krishna said, no, no, I'm not hungry today. I have no appetite. But when Vidura invited Lord Krishna to come, because Vidura is very devoted to Lord Krishna, Lord Krishna immediately accepted. But of course Vidura was in so much ecstasy that Lord Krishna is coming to his home, that Vidura only has some bananas to offer. And then by mistake, he threw the bananas away and offered the banana skins to Krishna. But Krishna did not think, oh, this is the banana skin. Krishna was so happy, but he is offering to me. I should eat. So this is how Lord Krishna recognizes the, the mood of the devotee. It's so important that we do the service with the right mood. It's not that we know a lot or we're a big scholar or we're a great pundit, but it's the devotion which is important. So when Srila Prabhupada introduced us to deity worship, he was always like that. He did not give us so much uh, attention to different mantras and rules and regulations and so on. But his important thing is the devotion, the mood in which you're performing, that we're doing these activities for the pleasure of Krishna. Even though we may be men very unqualified materially, but because we have that mood that we want to serve Krishna, we want to do something for Krishna's pleasure. That is the important aspect of devotional service. And this point is being made here in this verse. And the Purpur also then goes on to elaborate and talk about how some people, they take advantage of that point and they think, well, Krishna's telling me to do these things. Just like we had, there was this one lady one country where I traveled, there was one, this one lady, she saw how we were preaching Krishna consciousness and she decided she wanted to do her own thing, her own way. And so she wrote a book and then she said, Krishna told me, Bhagavad Gita is too old. We need a new book. This is Krishna told me to do it. And like this, and it was totally nonsense, speculations, there was nothing based on any Shastra, it did not follow Sadhu Shastra or Guru, there was no Parampara, it was just simply nonsense, garbage, which she was writing. But somehow she attracted so many people. People want to be cheeky, and somebody comes along, they're very gullible. They're easily taken in. So we try to present the truth, but it, the truth must be according to Sadhu Shastra and Guru. In the purport, the, uh, our commentators have quoted the verse that if you perform devotional service 
which is not in relation to the Shruti or the Smriti or the Puranas or the Kantara Shruti, then it is simply a disturbance in society. It just simply disturbs. Disturbs the day of the people who are following strictly. Create so much disturbance that they present some nonsense philosophy full of their own ideas and speculations and it just simply creates turmoil and confusion in the minds of innocent people. So we have to become strong, we have to become fixed in our Krishna conscious philosophy. That is why it's very important for us to read Prabhupada's books regularly and know what is the philosophy. Then we will not be tricked. If, unless we read regularly, then we will not know what is the true path of devotion. And we will never appreciate it. How fortunate we are to come to Krishna consciousness. So it's very important verse here, which we have been reading, uh, the verse was given to me by the organizers, they asked me to speak on this verse. It's a very, very good verse, you often find it referred to by the Acharyas, and describing that the supreme benefit of Bhakti Yoga, that we have Lord Krishna to help us in the day. Just like Prabhupada said one time, he said, you can bring anyone to me and I will answer them. I will answer their questions. He said, because Krishna will tell me. So Prabhupada had that faith that Lord Krishna is going to help. Teshaṁ satatayuktanam vajatam kritipurvakam dadami budiyogam tam yenama to those who are constantly devotee and worship me with love, I give the understanding by which they may come to me. So Lord Krishna helps the devotee. Because if we are properly devotee, if we are really trying our best to want to serve them, then Lord Krishna will help us to go by him. Of course, we have to be genuine in our efforts to cultivate Krishna consciousness. We have to put aside all the nonsense. We have to put away all of our material desires. And we have to simply want to be Krishna conscious. So we can see coming here to this place for the weekend, we had an opportunity for a lot of Krishna conscious association, a lot of Krishna conscious activities, and we could do a lot of hearing and chanting, which are so important for us in Krishna consciousness. So we are very grateful to the organizers that they could take so much trouble and we could we thank all of the devotees also for coming and participating in this wonderful event here to, over the weekend. We have a lot of things to do. We have a lot of activities going on in our own centers. And it's difficult sometimes to detach ourselves from other activities. But I think everyone who has come here has received a lot of benefit and is highly appreciative of everything which has taken place. So thank you very much. Are there any questions? No, 
we we operate to both during the party and uh, type of control control. Uh -huh. Where we distribute from products, bagot kita sa ibang bagot ng all the books from the products. Okay. During one of my head, one head period, when I was distributing, one of the guys from Gujarat is a lawyer by profession, a Punjabi. He came to our group. So I was giving him a Bhagavad Gita, giving him a Bhagavad Gita. I said, I said, I said, I said, I said, he said, he heard about the Bhagavad Gita, but according to him, they surrendered to Guru Nana. So when they surrendered to Guru, whatever the Guru says, they listen. So they told him to go high level for 30 years of opinion. Whereas in this form, we are emphasizing that Bhakti Yoga should follow the Supreme Lord and of course Guru plays a, Guru plays a part in doing the Paramahama. Now, what shall we, how shall we uh, uh, identify that he is more constant Guru than Paramahama? He is more constant with the Guru with the Guru. Then Paramahama. Who was the Guru? I mean, what was the Guru? Guru Nana. Guru Nana. The Pajami is referring to Guru Nana. Yeah, yeah, see. So they surrendered to Guru Nana. So they don't have to pray to any other God, any God, Supreme God. So Guru plays a very important role between Paramahama and Atma. So how shall we? How can we make it I mean, we have to explain to them. Yes. <coughs> yes. Yes. So Prabhu is saying that some people, they only listen to the Guru. They don't worship the Lord. And they don't, well, they have the Shastra, but the Shastra is from the Guru, right? Yes. The Shastra. Guru Nana. Yes, right. They have the book. The only book is from their Guru. So they only hear from the Guru. They don't hear from anyone else. They don't have any uh, deity. They don't worship God. Well, in other words, they're impersonal. Right? <laughs> because they only follow the Guru. They don't worship God. They just follow the Guru. So, uh, they're not going to get the mercy of the Lord. They have the shelter of their Guru. Actually, if you, if you know Guru Nanak, the Guru Nanak actually tells people to check the Holy Name. The, the, in the Grand Sab, the book of the Guru Nanak, it actually talks about chanting the Holy Name. And they're encouraged to chant the Holy Name. But they don't do it. Uh, it, 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 it said Lord Chaitanya, but he was on the planet at the same time as Guru Nanak. And one devotee wrote an article one time where he described it. He said that Lord Chaitanya had met Guru Nanak, or Guru Nanak had met him. Some, there was something about it, something deep. But what happens is in the course of time, people talk about following the Guru, but they just take the parts they like. They don't follow everything the Guru taught. You know, they're supposed to worship, follow the Guru, but the Guru also tells them to worship the Lord. Just like one of the Gurus there in, in the Sikh religion is Guru Gopin Singh. So his name is Gopin. <laughs> the name of the Lord. They yeah. use his name Gopin. So, we want to convince people to understand that there's not just only Guru, but there's also Sadhus and Shastra. And, and you have to have a check on what the Guru is teaching. If we don't check what the Guru teaches, then you could be easily misled. So, 
if you have also Shastra to support it, and then also other sadhu, then you can, just like in the Bhagavad Gita, in the 13th chapter, Lord Krishna is explaining an important point to Arjuna to understand whether or not there's oneness or duality. And so Lord Krishna states that according to the Vedanta Sutra, Lord Krishna mentions Vedanta Sutra. The, this, he said this point is explained in the Vedanta Sutra and is also presented by the previous great sages also. And then Arjuna also, when he accepts Krishna, Arjuna also says, it's not, he's not accepting Krishna just himself, but he said, not only do I accept Krishna, but Asita, Devama, Vyasa, Narada, they have all seen this and they all accept Krishna also. So Arjuna is not just simply basing everything on Lord Krishna's words. Lord Krishna said he is the supreme truth, but Lord Krishna, Arjuna understood that so many great sages, they also accepted that, uh, that Krishna was the supreme truth. And he, this is stated in the Bhagavad Gita, that there are other authorities, not just one authority. They, they say absolute power, power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So there's always a danger of corruption. If you put everything into, just like they say, you put all your eggs in one basket. <laughs> so eggs are fragile, it can be easily be broken. So if you base everything on one person, it's very dangerous. And that is why in our Krishna consciousness movement, we have Paramkara. We don't just base everything only on Prabhupada, but we have also the Acharyas and we have the Shastra. We're not just saying only Guru. If you just have only Guru, then you're missing what is actually being taught by the Shastra. And the Shastra, you have Vedic knowledge, it is, you know, that knowledge is given from the beginning of the creation. You have so much scriptural knowledge there, and we have so many saintly persons. Are you just going to disregard every saintly person? And you don't accept any Shastra, and you only take one man, and you base everything on him. That is not very logical, it's not very safe. You can easily be misled. If you just have only the Guru, how do you check what the Guru is teaching? You want to check what, the, what is being taught to us. And that is why Shastra is important and that is why Sadhus are also important. We have to hear from other people. What do they say? So other Sadhus, saintly persons, they say Krishna is the Supreme Truth. Great say, Asita, Vivala, Narada, Vyas, they all say Krishna is the Supreme Truth. Arjuna says, now I am also accepting this. And we read from other scriptures, from based on scriptural evidence. Someone was asking yesterday how to understand Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So we have Shastra, we have Shastric evidence. Srimad Bhagavatam, Rati Kanto, Karabhajana Muni says to Nam Marashmini that Krishna comes in the Kali Yuga to establish the Sankirtan movement. And it's also stated in the Mahabharata. In the Mahabharata it also describes how the Lord will come in golden color and in his heavenly life he'll be a householder. Later on he will renounce everything and he will be peaceful and he will banish the impersonal philosophy by his teaching. So Shastra is there to present the position of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and so many great sages are also there who follow Mahaprabhu. 
present the teachings. The work of the Muslim people, personalities like Sabahama Bhattacharya. And probably in the purport here today we have Prakashananda Sarasati, who was a very prominent person. He was the head of the Mayavadis. He was living in Benares. And he had, at first he was thinking Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is a sentimentalist. But when he met Lord Chaitanya, and when he heard from Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, then he also chanted Hare Krishna. He also began to chant Hare Krishna. He took up Krishna and Lord Chaitanya even took prasada with him. Although Lord Chaitanya usually never associated with the Maya bodies, never met with them, but after this time, because they, they chanted Hare Krishna, so then Lord Chaitanya went and sat with them and took prasad. Because he thought, now they are Vaishnavas because they have chanted the Holy Name. So we see great impersonalists changing, becoming devotees. And so everything can be understood, not just simply by only hearing from Guru, but we have to hear also from Shastra, and we have to hear also from Sadhus, also saintly persons. So three authorities are there. The, the, just like tracks, the tracks have to be parallel. If there's any disagreement, then something is wrong. You haven't got to train. There has to be complete agreement between Sadhu, Shastra and Guru. And when we say Shastra, what Shastra? Shruti, Smriti, Puranadi, Pantalakshiti. These things are important. All the scriptures, the, the Vedas, the Smriti, the Puranas, and they're all explaining the absolute truth. We have to understand the message of these scriptures very carefully. So, how to understand? We don't just hear only from the Guru. We have to hear also from the Sadhus, from the saintly persons. We hear from the great Acharyas in the line of the sacred succession. Presenting the absolute truth. And it can all be understood. And there's no contradictions. If you find some contradiction, then something is wrong. So you want to present to the, the, the Sikh gentleman? But we have a number of Sikh devotees in our Krishna consciousness movement. There is one lady who is from a Sikh family and she's written books. She's an initiated disciple of Srila Gopal Krishna Goswami and she's written books about Sikhism and Vaishnavism. And she's describing about how the Sikh tradition is also connected to Vaishnavism. So you can get copies of her books. She lives in New Delhi and she's a very active preacher. She's on the internet a lot. When she goes online, thousands of people come to visit. She's a devotee.